Go ahead, Tom. Uh, Guru Margaret Kerley, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not aware of any apologies from the Sinn Féin group in this evening. Chair Guru Margaret, thank you. Thank you. I think we've got the feedback sorted. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Um, Councillor Warrington. Not aware of any apologies, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Is Councillor Garde joining us? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, two Mary. apologies, Councillor Gannon and Councillor Paul Blake. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And Councillor Robinson. No apologies, Chair. Thank you. Is there any other apologies, members? Okay. Um, just b before we go on into the business members, it's quite a heavy agenda, as you will know. So, um, maybe just with your cooperation tonight, if you could uh, try and be brief. We're going to take the agenda as is right through to item um, 6.6, .6, all the reports for decision, and then we're going to move to confidential uh, to get that business done. And then we'd all been well moved back and complete the rest of the reports for information and correspondence. Okay. So thank you for that. Uh, the item two is to sign the minutes and confidential minutes of the previous meeting held on the 8th of November, and they've been signed, members. Is there any declarations of interest? Item number three. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, declarations of interest at this time, 6.6, uh, .6, uh, as a member of the Event Strategy Working Group. Uh, item number 7.2, 7.4 and 14, as a member of the Planning Committee. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Robinson. Uh, 7.2, 7.4, 14, Planning Committee and 12, FLT. Thank you, Councillor Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, 6.6, 6, the Event Strategy Working Group. I have 13 F FLT. Um, no, sorry, 12 uh, FLT. And somewhere else there was the Geo Park, the management of the Geo Park. I haven't noted which uh, part it is, but uh, I just didn't declare an interest to be on the safe side. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robert Airbank. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Item 7.2, 7.4, and 14 as a member of the Planning Committee. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just item 12 and confidential as a member of the FLT as well. Thank you. Councillor McLaughrey. Thank you, Chair. It's 7.2, 7.4, and 14 as a member of the Planning Committee. And Councillor Rene. Thank you, Chair. 6.12 and 7.14. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Just go to WebEx members, Councillor McPhillips. Thanks, Chair. Uh, 6.6 6 Event Strategy Working Group and Item 12, uh, member of FLT as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor O'Reilly. 6.6 6, uh, Events and uh, 12 FLT. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's all, members. Sure, if there's any more, we can pick them up. Councillor Crawford has his hand up there just. Councillor Crawford. We'll pick them up as we go along anyway, members. Okay. Did you get unmuted, Councillor Crawford? No. Okay. We'll get that maybe as we go, members. Uh, just as we go through matters rising, there's quite a number of pieces of correspondence that we'll pick up as we go through here, so members can just be aware of that. Um, we'll go through the matters rising from the meeting on the 8th of November. Um, page one, page two, page two, there's a piece of correspondence, Kim. Thank you, Chair. So there's a piece of correspondence at 942, uh, received from DERA around uh, rising, rising costs. Um, it's from the Permanent Secretary in response to the representations from Council, and the letter refers to Direct payments issued to farmers six weeks earlier than previously, uh, a one-off increase of 2.04% in the basic payment scheme, uh, a rising costs task force led by CAFRI, and the references to the Northern Ireland Energy Bill Relief Scheme for non-domestic cost customers, which will ease energy costs. It also refers to the severe issues being faced by pig producers and um, the intention to implement a support scheme it clarifies that there, there are no other regions offering specific funding to deal with exceptional inflationary costs. 
and uh, also that it's not within the the um, boundaries of, of DRO officials to implement any new funding schemes in the absence of a minister. Thank you, Kim, that for an open that piece of correspondence. Councillor Green. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I suppose uh, not surprised with the correspondence at all. Um, it's something similar that uh, Minister Poot had, uh, had sent to us. Uh, it's uh, the last letter that he uh, wrote while he was a minister. He admitted that um, nothing could be done without the executive approval. So uh, he did say that he had applied for 70 million to help uh, with the farmers, but that it couldn't be progressed uh, without an executive. So uh, there you go again. Uh, you know, uh, our ordinary people, the ordinary rural people, farmers, and that are being held to ransom by uh, the DUP uh, on their uh, protocol uh, blackmail to the people of the north. And it's absolutely scandalous. But uh, so, uh, that's it. No, it's nothing but uh, what we expected from the black. Okay, councillor, councillor Anthony Feely. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and I just, just kind of disappointed with the letter as well, and I'll not say much about it, but just singling out the pink farmers that's be struggling. Out. It's not just the pink farmers that's struggling, the hill farmers and every other farmer struggling as well. Just disappointed as well. Thank you, um, Chair. Okay, have we just a uh, member to note proposed by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Dan Armstrong? Thank you. Page, that was page two members, page three. Page four, then is there another piece? Was there a piece on page three? Oh, sorry. Okay, the bottom of page two, member. Sorry, there's um, a broadband piece at nine point three and nine point five, and your your correspondence, Kim. So the item nine point three is correspondence from Department for the Economy, which has really given us an update on Project Stratum and the rollout of Project Gigabit, and advising that there is going to be an open market review to inform the rollout of and the intervention area for Project Gigabit. And then correspondence from OpenReach, which is in response to the Council's query around um, the infrastructure, extent of infrastructure, which BT OpenReach has installed since the contract for Project Stratum was awarded to Fibrous. Um, the, the response gives an update on the overall rollout, but um, not specifically in relation to our query. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barton. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much, Chairman, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, it is concerning that you, you spoke that this wasn't in relation to our query. Our query was about uh, mobile phones, etc., and mobile um, signals. And in, there's a number of areas I know in mid Tyrone where the mobile phone signal is very, very poor. And broadband's totally different to the mobile phone signal. And I'm wondering, could you again emphasise, I know we, you spoke of Vodafone there and you spoke of EE. There are a number of other mobile phone providers. Is it possible to contact them and see what they're doing in relation to the rollout of the signal in mid Tyrone And indeed, parts of Fermanagh too. I'll so that's a, a response. Mm -hmm. Are you happy to uh, note the two pieces? Of course. Yes, yes, Thank certainly. You. Yep. Okay. Councillor O'Reilly. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to second the noting of the two pieces there, but uh, just to say also about the signal, obviously, in parts of Fermanagh, and, and uh, it is not good despite uh, all the investment that has gone in there. So if we can get any further detail or highlight the issue, all the better. But can I say that this uh, thing where they are going out to um, do a full consultation on the Project Gig Gigabyte uh, and to start uh, doing all the checking again and to finding out, we're not that long having done all of that. And there is quite a, 
a comprehensive data set, even though that we mightn't agree that it is entirely accurate, uh, that data set is there. And I'm just wondering, uh, and I suppose it's well beyond our uh, remit to influence, but how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, is going to be spent on this? Uh, and then uh, when are we getting a rollout? And, and who has the actual say of what premises is on that rollout or not? So uh, it was not very clear from the correspondence chair. So I don't know if we can ascertain any of that information, Kim. Okay. Are you happy to second the the, the response as well, proposed by Councillor Barton? Thomas? Yes, indeed. Okay. And Kim, can we find out some of that information for Councillor O'Reilly? Okay, Councillor Swift. Girl, Maggot, Chair, yes, and just to support the last two members, um, indeed, I had raised the whole issue about uh, mobile phone signal, particularly in my own area, where it's just completely non-existent for no apparent reason whatsoever. We're all aware of the time the G8 came and signal, mobile signal dropped, and we were, were reassured of fantastic signal and investment in that particular digital infrastructure as a result of welcoming the G8 and it never happened and indeed we lost signal and that's just not good enough so the question was what was causing the bad cell phone signal and they have completely circumvented the question that we asked and quite rightly asked on behalf of our constituents who once again are paying for a service that they are not in receipt of and it's all very well blowing about all these other great schemes that are to do with broadband we don't want to know about that at this point we still want to know the answer to our question so reinforce it please Kim in the most strongest of terms and um, because we can't be bothered reading what we already know uh, but we want to know why there is still no signal and proper infrastructure digitally here in the rural region. Garamagat Cahirlach. Thank you Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. Thank you Chair and I wasn't going to come in, but I think it was it's important because no particularly in our own area, Mark and Don Quinn, the coverage is very, very poor. I wonder is it worth uh, maybe a Kim could advise, would it be worth proposing that as a meeting is set up or that they engage properly with this district and identify the areas where the coverage is so poor? Because in this day and age, it is ridiculous that people have little or no mobile phone coverage because so many people rely on it. As a very as a basic entitlement, really, it's it's a day to day thing that everyone needs. Maybe Kim, if you could advise, do you think that would be possible? If we had a meeting with whether it's Vodafone, O2 representatives, Virgin Media, whatever, I think that would be useful. Yeah, we could certainly invite them to to, to brief members at an informal meeting. I, I suppose I'm I'm not sure if they would come collectively and share their rollout plans, but maybe that won't be an issue. Um, but Certainly, we can extend an invitation. Yeah, just, just to see if it's possible to identify those areas where there's certainly gaps in coverage because it's 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 not at the minute the service people are getting is very poor at the moment and it's not acceptable. Do you need me to propose that, Kim? Yeah, that's okay. I'll take that as a proposal. proposal. Yep. Thank, thank you, you Councillor. And Councillor Garda. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And just to support Anne Marie in her comments there, and if she needs a seconder. Um, you know, it can do no harm anyway, so I'm happy to second that proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Clark. Chair, I was going to support and second the proposal, but it's happy enough. I mean, I live in an area where there is, you know, where there's no coverage, but no, I'm happy to support the general sentiments here. Okay, thank you. That's great, members. Okay, we'll move on. That's passed. I think we're on page three and on to page four. There's an item. On page four, John. Yeah, thank you, Chair. There, there are two items um, at the top of page four as part of 4.3. Uh, the first one is in relation to the Department of Education's response, uh, which is included at 9.1 of the correspondence uh, relating to gaps in youth provision in Erin West and Mid Tyrone and the possibility of additional funding. Um, the Education Authority, the Department of Education tells the Education Authority. Uh, is currently working to agree a regional local assessment of need for the period 2023 to 2026 um, and that will enable the identification of gaps in service provision and inform local uh, development plans for, for funding opportunities. 
um, and that the funding opportunities for the period from the 1st of April 2023 uh, is due to be published by the Education Authority Youth Service uh, later in, in December. Uh, there is also an offer uh, at the in the last paragraph, should the council members feel there's a specific lack of youth provision in any area, that they can discuss the matter with the Education Authority uh, head of uh, local youth services. Okay, Chair, maybe I'll just move on to, to four point one. Is correspondence from the Education Authority in relation to a query uh, of Strathroy Youth Club and, and lack of funding. Um, they have informed us that Strathroy Youth Club have not applied for the Education Authority generic non-targeted funding for the year 2022-23, um, and as the scheme is closed, the funding isn't available uh, any longer. Uh, and uh, they're happy that the, the Start Royal Youth Club apply once the scheme relaunches in 2023. Okay, Councillor McAlduff, you, you, one of these issues was... Thank you, Chair. Um, the point that was raised with me was that it was a technical issue and it wasn't addressed in that letter. Um, you know, I'm not saying that the Trust, or sorry, the EA in this case, are guilty of maladministration, but I'm told that in the application process, that Strathroy Youth Club people encountered a technical difficulty, IT, and were confident that they had met the deadline. So, uh, again, we're not always big fans of writing copious letters, but maybe a letter back seeking clarity. Was there a technical issue? Um, is, it, is it being con contested that the, the youth club people themselves met the deadline but experienced an IT glitch? and are being punished for that. You know, there's no flexibility being shown. And and if that's the case, then I would ask for the EA, and we should ask for the EA to revisit the funding for this period, you know, from October, that six-month period from October. Because, uh, again, I highlighted the reasons why in the last uh, contribution, um, you know, socially deprived neighbourhood renewal area. Um, recent particular problems where young people need to be safe and their families need to be assured that they are safe. And uh, there's a particular uh, issue there, a particular incident or series of incidents, uh, which uh, would make that even more compelling. So uh, again, I'm proposing a return letter because I don't think they addressed the issue of inflexibility in the way the application was handled. But and because they experienced a technical glitch, uh, they're being punished and just told, wait on the next round of funding. Because they're helping significant large number of young people in that area with uh, uh, weekly provision, I think twice a week, uh, Stale Youth Club. So that's it, basically. Thank you, Chair. Are you happy to include the noting of the two pieces in that yes. as well, that proposal? Yep. Thank you, Councillor McAuliffe and Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I'm happy enough to second the proposing to note and thank second you. Councillor McAuliffe's proposal. But if you give me a wee bit of uh, leeway, I'd like to raise an issue to do with young people and the Education Authority, so I think it, it's timely to raise it on this point. Um, I've been lobbied quite heavily by uh, the principal of OMA Academy, and an issue she raises quite consistently is the lack of hockey pitch provisions within OMA. And well, as OMA as the as the as the major town, it also covers uh, young people within the wider OMA area. Uh, OMA currently has one hockey pitch. It used to have three, but uh, two of them have been ter since turned into football pitches. And um, I would like to propose that we write to the Education Authority if they. Uh, would look into the possibility of uh, of providing another hockey pitch in Oma. The suggestion uh, that was given to me, and I'm open to suggestions, but just the one that was written to me specifically was the old Arvalee site has um, old uh, pitches, and if a hockey pitch could be put there, it would help uh, tens of I, I wouldn't go maybe we could go as far as saying hundreds of uh, young people in Oma because at the minute. Um, the academy and high school who have hockey teams and um, many of their young girls are going to training uh, day in day out and actually getting very little playing time and that obviously isn't good so that's my proposal thank okay, you chair thank you councillor Fitzgerald, you had your hand up there yes um i want to um second um councillor's um proposal there i think that um seeing um the young pupils young females in the hockey pitch there in Romano is quite a large number of them so i'd be more than delighted um of second his proposal and it's great to see girls engaged in, 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 in hockey and the only way of getting hockey is to get them 
better facilities, near hand facilities to get them there, and also in support of of, of um Councillor McIntyre Barry's um, proposal there as well. Um, from what I can get, and it was a technical hitch, and that um Barry's right that this report hasn't really exactly said of what happened, so maybe more clarity. And it's good to see that they will be working with them, but it's not the response that I was also seeking there as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor and Councillor Barton. Thank you. I would also like like to support Councillor Bell in his proposal in relation to hockey pitches. We've got a great interest in hockey now among young people in this Oma Oma area and the and the wider area. And one hockey pitch is certainly not adequate provision for the number that are interested in it. So Okay. Okay, members. I think that's agreed. That's great. We'll move on. Thank you. That was page four. And then on to page five. I think we'll pick up correspondence items four, two, and four, three. Is that right? Yeah, Chair, four, 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 two, Chair, uh, from the Department of Health in relation to the introduction of licensing scheme for non cosmetic uh, procedures. Uh, they claim that the Department's Medicines Regulatory Group have carried out an enforcement and compliance program and, and some of the detail or some of the shortcomings in the in the prescribing processes and the breaches of those are are, are highlighted uh, and, and referrals have been made to, to the various professional bodies. Uh, the department's also aware of the change in health and social care environment um, and they've developed a new regulatory policy uh, which includes the principles of regulation so work is, is ongoing in relation to the first phase of this. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to bring in four? Four three as well. Later on. So. Oh sorry it's later on. Okay we'll take four two members. Do we have a proposal to note that please? Councillor Armstrong and a seconder. Councillor Paul Robinson and agreed. Thank you members. So we'll go to page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, and page twelve. There's something to pick up on page twelve. Nine point six. Yes, Chair. So correspondence uh, at nine point six in your papers from the Department for Infrastructure Permanent Secretary in relation to St Lucia site and the correspondence confirms that the historic core remains in the ownership of the Ministry of Defence and uh, no funding will transfer with the land and as such it remains DFI's position not to accept the transfer of the historic core at this time. That's an update for an open as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor McElduff. Yeah, very disappointing. You know, we need political will we need political will at the highest level in DFA to unlock the potential of the St Lucia site, um, not just the core area, which they're not receiving at this time, um, but also other aspects of the site. Um, in the very, very immediate short term, we're trying to improve and extend the Riverside Walk with kind of non-interruptive access to a, a lane, a path there. Um, to bring it out to the dairy road for the people. Um, so that's one thing, but the long term or middle term, we shouldn't say long term because that means Neverland. Uh, the middle term, you might say, uh, we need high level political will from the Department for Infrastructure. And that's another of the reasons why we need the political institutions re established and ministerial investment, ministerial will. But we've had poor engagement from DFA historically. Uh, we did have the visit of John O'Dowd when he was a caretaker minister with only seven weeks to go. And, uh, you know, we, we raised issues there. But we need we need the, the ministers in place and a, a minister in place. Uh, I have a memory with others. Others in this room will have been directly involved uh, in lobbying for the Lessonelli campsite to be transferred to the executive for the purpose of developing an education village. Um, there was a kind of a combined community effort. Um, our own council, you know, and the then chief executive, Danny McSorley, was directly involved. Pat Doherty MP, Monsignor Donnelly, Reverend Robert Hearn. There was a very strong team lobbying together for for that to happen. It happened. You know, it happened. Um, I remember at interparliamentary meetings talking to Michael Mates about it, and uh, he supported it. Uh, we met Sean Woodward together, all that kind of thing. So there was a lot of lobbying went in to secure the transfer of the Lissanelli site. 
and the same needs to happen with respect to the St Lucia site. So maybe, Chair, could I ask the Chief Executive maybe to comment on the state of play and the hope or lack of hope that we have, because we have plans for this site. Uh, the people have plans, the people have vision. Uh, so maybe to ask the Chief Executive to comment on the state of play with regard to St Lucia and how we might take it forward. Okay. Awesome. Okay, Chair, thank you. Um, I suppose I would certainly concur with Councillor McEldoff's comments and it's been the stated position of the Council around this being a, an opportunity site and has been reflected as such within the OMA Play Shaping Plan. I think the significant difference in relation to St Lucia and Lisanelli is that St Lucia, uh, the intent is that it is disposed of for financial gain for the Northern Ireland Executive. And I think that is the main issue that is actually stymieing the transfer of the listed building, the associated costs with those. And it's always been our position that uh, the listed core in particular should be accompanied by a dowry to allow it to be appropriately and sympathetically developed. Personally, in the current economic climate, and I think even looking back over the last number of years and the very limited progress that has been made, I certainly wouldn't be optimistic that there will be a new desire for this to become into community ownership, but maybe in a new uh, mandate, that might be something that could be explored. I think the, the other maybe disappointing aspect, Chair, just as again, as Councillor McEldoff has summarised, it was our intent really for both the feasibility of the extension of the Riverside Walk and potential utilisation of Parade Square for events and other matters to be explored. Um, and I don't think we have had the perhaps level of cooperation that we would have anticipated. Uh, I do understand there are some proposals uh, that have been submitted to the department, but we haven't been privy to the detail of those. Okay, members, thank you for that, Alison. Do we have just a proposal for the, the piece of correspondence before us? For, for noting it anyway. Thank you, Councillor McGill. Councillor Thompson there as well. Yeah, I'll just second the noting at this time. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Okay. Maybe it's something we can raise at a later stage, Councillor McGill. Thank you, members. Um, that was us on page 12 and page 13. John as well has a piece of correspondence. Yeah, yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, it's uh, correspondence from Lakeland Community Care in relation to the removal of um, services from Garrison. And you will see there that um, the services, the Lakeland Community Care inform us that the services in Garrison have not been removed, but have been reduced due to funding issues within the Western Health and Social Care Trust for daycare. Okay, that's the response. Thank you, Councillor Coyle. Is that Councillor Debbie Coyle? Did it? Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. Just I'm losing my voice a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, just um, I, I think this letter is actually very concerning because Lakeland doesn't just provide care services in, in Garrison. It, it provides it across the um, council area, or definitely in Fermanagh anyway, and I, I would like to um, propose that we actually look for clarification on this from the trust, because part of the um, you know reason why some people are, are literally living in the hospital as opposed to needing acute care is because they, there's no care in the community. So, like, it's just, I mean, if this is correct, it's just astounding that the trust are... Um, reducing funds in the very area where it's most needed to um, free up beds in the hospital and to get people home where they actually want to be. So can I propose that we look for clarification around this with the actual trust? Okay, and are you happy to note the correspondence as well in your proposal? Absolutely, yeah, and to note the correspondence, yeah. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, happy enough to second that. I think the the email that's come back to us is it's really quite dismissive. It's like two teenagers who aren't speaking to each other. Like, please inform Mr. Boyle that the past the parcel and lack of responsibility is hugely concerning. Um, I would actually propose that as well, come back to the trust, we do go back to uh, Lakeland Community Care, um, asking them the same question. But also, I would put the question to them, um, what is the level of reduction or the comparison of services offered now compared to when they were fully funded or fully operational? 
because I think that is the key question to all of this. Um, there's obviously been a noted reduction in services or stopping of services, depending on who you listen to. So I'd like to know what is the, the level, what is the direct impact on people in that area in terms of what is being offered and what's available now and what was. So I'd like to either include that in our initial proposal or add that as a separate proposal. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Okay. Councillor Debbie Coyle, are you happy just to include that as well? That's yours. Yeah, um, yeah, it can be. Yeah, it can be included. Yeah, no problem. Councillor Anthony Feely. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, and um, there must, there must be a wee bit of confusion when we um proposed this. For I, I knew that the service wasn't taken away altogether. It was only reduced. I knew that beforehand because it um some of the residents gone on to me straight away about it here in Garrison, and I know for a fact. I don't know exact figures, but a few years ago there would have been four or five days a week. The people was going there before COVID, and then it stopped altogether during COVID, which was very tough for, for them people. And then, when they just get back to going there, they cut it. It was two days in uh, Garrison, and it was two days in Belcoo. I think it was Monday and Wednesday in Garrison, and Tuesday and Thursday in Belcoo, and there was days in Derrigoni as well. So it has been scaled back from about four days to two days, and now scaled back to one day. I already knew that, but. What I was wondering was the reason why, and I was thinking it was funding from the trust. So I'm um, um, I'm going to second Debbie's proposal to write back to the trust about the funding issue. But I think that um, two days is little enough for the people. Like the people enjoy it, they go down there and they get a hot meal and they be chatting their friends and have a good day. And it's a boost to the town as well. The restaurant in the town where the food comes from. So if we could keep it at two days, it would be great for the for the people. So I'd be happy to. Second, is that Emmett or Debbie's proposal? Yeah, thank trust. you. I think I think we have that proposal seconded. Thank you, Councillor Feely. Councillor Swift. Yeah, Garmagat, I want to give support to this and voice again. Lake, Lake, Lakeland Community Care operates in the rural Erin West area. And if we are expected to be supporting the shift left health agenda, well, then they need to invest in this service. And LCC have been suffering time and time again at, at the whim of WHSCT when they decide to um, not, not make reforms, but it's cuts. Um, LCC do operate in Belcoo, Darragon, Lee Garrison and Timor. And it used to be four days a week, but since COVID, it's down to three days. But to reduce to two days does cause severe hardship for many. Uh, and the services, as we already know, are already thin on the ground. And so many older people do rely on it um, for their overall mental health and well-being and indeed their social activity. The numbers are good. The uptake has always been good. And I know for a fact that there are people on a waiting list for Timor, for example. Um, but the trust have reduced the funding and LCC have always been very, very accommodating in regard to all of the services. But the concerns have been raised and not least by the social workers who are working in the area. Um, and they actually have patients who would be in nursing homes only for the respite care that they have been given by the very invaluable LCC service. And we had uh, the chairman of the council out visiting LCC recently and LCC voiced their concerns and their opinions to us. Uh, local Erin West DEA's uh, councillors on that day. So we know very well and we want to support them always and ensure that these rural services are most certainly sustained and not definitely not cut any further. Garmagat. Thank you. And Councillor John Coyle. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I have had been contacted about this issue as well uh, and I'd raise concerns. Uh, welcome that it is uh, back to two days a week. Uh, I had speak, uh, spoken to a constituent and uh, like Councillor Swift said that uh, she was an anxious and worried about, you know, not having nowhere to go. And uh, it, she was overjoyed when uh, it has been reinstated, but uh, it covers some of our north as well, uh, Bleak, uh, Bow kind of ward. So, um, you know, it's a great a great thing to have and people love to go and attend it. Um, funding, uh, I support going back to the trust for to see exactly what's going on, but we do need answers and it probably needs to be ring fenced uh, for the future so that this doesn't cause any stress, worry and anxiety for constituents when they are going to that centre. Thank you. OK, thank you. And Councillor Michael Duff. Just to agree with the previous uh, councillors and uh, Councillor Swift used the phrase 
if we are expected to shift left, then invest. You know, that's absolutely right. And in that Aaron West DEA day, that was one of the standout messages from a very strong organization. I'm just wondering if that group has ever requested an informal meeting with us. Um, because uh, I, I would propose an informal meeting with the group, you know, because this is really an important message coming right from the heart of the community. Uh, so I think we should have an informal meeting so that we can add voice uh, for their lobbying. OK, can I take your hand as a second, Councillor Feely? Yes, yes, second, oh. happy to say. We'll, we'll move that on. Is that OK? And we can have that looked at. Yeah, and John, thank you. OK, members, we'll move on. That was page 13 and page 14 of the minutes. That's the matter's horizon. Complete members. Thank you. We'll just move on now. Next item is item 5.1 is to consider a report on the Department for Infrastructure consultation paper regarding proposals to amend permitted development rights. Kim, paper A. Thank you, Chair. So this paper is in relation to a consultation document. Um, the closing date for receipt of comments 23rd of December. The consultation is attached as Appendix 3 and a suggested response as Appendix 1. It relates to permitted development rights for air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. It also relates to domestic wind turbines, but doesn't. Uh, and advises that DFI doesn't intend to bring forward proposals to provide for permitted development rights for domestic wind turbines at this time, but is seeking views on whether or not there is demand for that and also refers to permitted development rights for reverse spending machines and it's recommended the council agrees the draft consultation response outlined in appendix one for submission to dfi thank you kim for that you've seen the consultation response members can we have a proposal please for the consultation response oh sorry councillor robinson uh proposed councillor o'reilly is his hand up yep uh chair happy to uh propose there just uh, the thinking on the domestic turbines, if I could have a little bit of a, a sort of a clarity around that. OK, thank you, Tom. I'll just take Thomas as a second, if that's OK. And Paul to propose. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Kim? Yes, so the um, department doesn't intend to bring forward permitted development rights for domestic wind turbines, but uh, the consultation notes that Scotland, England and Wales do provide those permitted development rights. And in the Republic of Ireland, Exempted development provides for one turbine within the curtilage of a house subject to a number of restrictions. Um, the consultation response, which we've provided, identifies that the Council would promote limited permitted development rights for domestic wind turbines, which strikes a balance between facilitating renewable technology and protection of landscapes and public amenity, um, and believes that not taking forward legislation at this stage is, is a missed opportunity. Are you happy with that? Councillor Riley? Yeah, I suppose there's nothing much more stronger than that that we can really put in. I just think with this cost of living and all of the rest, and particularly for the farming community and so forth, that uh, you know that this is a, an opportunity here to uh, to push this on a little bit further. But I suppose that's as about as strong we are disagreeing with it. So oh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Riley, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. No, I'm going to have to dissent on this one in relation to the response on the PDR for wind turbines. I think there's too many issues in relation to this particular subject locally and indeed within my own DEA to just um, permit it to go through as permitted development rights. I appreciate that there are uh, leanings towards um, some restrictions, but I think having witnessed what has gone and what has gone on uh, locally, I can't support that, so I'm going to uh, register just my dissent in relation to the, the item on the wind turbines and permitted developments from Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. OK, members, that's agreed, and we'll record Councillor McAleer's dissent on that one. Um, we'll move on to item 5.2, is to consider a report uh, on the Department of Justice consultation paper regarding fees to be charged for planning appeals and deemed planning applications from the 1st of April 23. You. Thanks, Chair. So again, this is this is a consultation. It's one which has been issued by the Department of Justice in relation to fees for planning appeals and deemed planning applications. Um, the consultation document is there, and 
the draft response is also uh, outlined 2.6 really just to advise that the council supports the alignment of fees for planning appeals and deemed planning applications and it's to align with the current fees charged for planning applications which will provide clarity for officers agents and applicants and appellants and reduce the potential for confusion so it's recommended that the council uh, considers and agrees the suggested responses outlined thank you kim okay members again we're looking for a proposal for the the consultation. Any tickers? Councillor Warrington to propose. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Sorry, Chair, just again, I'm going to register dissent on this one. I think the appeal system is skewed um, in favour of what's termed the developer. And when you're raising the fee, even though it's only by a couple of pounds, it's still making it more uh, difficult for residents, local community groups, those concerned with their home, with their local environment and biodiversity to actually register appeals for us. The, again, what's termed the developer has an automatic right of appeal and um, the local people don't have that. That's something that's fundament a fundamental flaw in the planning system. It needs to be rectified. There needs to be a, a third party right of appeal for people who are affected by these things going up in their areas that they don't want. So again, I'm just going to register dissent on this one. Thank you. Okay, that's okay, councillor. Thank you, and a second, our members for that, councillor Paul Robinson. Thank you. That's agreed, members, and vote accord. Councillor McAleer's dissent on that. Thank you. Council, um, item five point three, members, is to consider reporting material alterations to the draft Leitrim County Development Plan, Paper C. Thank you, Chair. So again, the purpose of this report is to provide members with a review of the proposed material alterations to the draft Leitrim County Development Plan. Um, the report outlines the reference to the, the documentation and the, provides a link to access that. Uh, counts, following consideration of, of representations, Leitrim is now proposing to make material alterations to its plan. Uh, a number of proposed amendments relate to the inclusion of additional policy objectives and that necessitates an overall renumbering of policy objectives from those contained in the draft plan, as well as a number of material alterations, which also include detail in relation to monitoring. And a copy of the consultation document is attached as Appendix 1 and a suggested response as Appendix 1A. And it's recommended the Council agrees the draft consultation response for submission to Leitrim County Council. Thank you, Kim. Councillor Feely. Yeah, happy to propose, um, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Feely. Have we a second, our members? Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll, I'll second this. I, am, I suppose I think it's worth bearing in mind or worth noting the public pressure in Leitrim, which has led to the strengthening of the local plan uh, in terms of re removal of certain uh, toxic, poisonous chemicals in extractive industries. I suppose my one concern is that whilst they mightn't permit them in Leitrim, if and when uh, the governments get their way and uh, extraction and exploitation begins in County Leitrim, that we could see this waste being brought up the road to Greencastle County to own for processing. So that's something that has to be minded against um, and worked against as we proceed as a, a local authority. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, that's proposed and seconded. We all agreed. Thank you. Okay, item 5.4 5 .5, um, Sorry, is to consider a report on Plan and Building Control Climate Change Information Leaflet and Toolkit, which has been produced. So, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, as you've mentioned, this is a previous decision of the Council that the Planning and Building Control Departments would work together to produce an information leaflet on the issues of climate change. Um, so, an, a leaflet has been, has been designed, um, it, uh, which includes uh, an adaption toolkit and uh, it's attached as Appendix 1. Appendix 2 also includes a uh, drawing or design of, of a climate friendly um, house uh, or home. So the leaflet and, and guide are there for, for members' consideration. It's recommended that the Council agrees the Home Information Leaflet and Adaptation Toolkit and the image of an energy efficient home and promotes the information outlined within the leaflet on its communication channels and to customers of the planning and building control departments. Thank you, Kim, and best thanks to those involved in the production of that. It's um, very good indeed. So if we have a proposal for that, please, members. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Councillor, Councillor Thompson, thank you. And a hand there, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Happy to second. Okay, members, thank you. We'll move on to item 5.5 .5, is to consider a report on draft and a scale and place shipping plan and consultation process. Thank you, Chair. So, work towards development of an and scale and place shipping plan commenced in March of this year. Um, a steering group was established and has been meeting on a monthly basis to consider the development of the plan and support the consultation and engagement processes. So the purpose of this report is to provide members with an update on progress and to seek approval to proceed to public consultation on the draft plan. The draft plan is attached to the document as Appendix 1. It includes an overarching ambition, which is to bring a restorative reset to re-establish a sense of Enniskillen as a naturally welcoming and beautiful island town linked to the water. Targeted collaborative investment will position Enniskillen as a healthy, people-first, connected and sustainable town, a, vi a vibrant community, enterprise and tourism hub for Fermanagh. The plan sets out six key themes which are outlined at paragraph 2.3 and aligned to those themes there are 15 key actions with a range of sub actions or best ideas then which identify how those key actions will be delivered. We now propose to move to a detailed period of public consultation and um, that will open from the 9th of January until the 27th of February and will be publicised through a variety of media including social media, press releases, posters and e-distribution lists as well as two public webinars on Monday 6th of February and Saturday 24th of February so we are trying a weekend slot to see if we can increase uh, participation um, because it's been very difficult I suppose to engage people so we're trying a whole, a whole range of, of different times and slots. There is also an advanced programme of activity to target schools and that's to encourage and increase participation from, from young people. So it's recommended that the draft and skill and place shape plan is approved for consultation purposes and that runs from 7th of January to the 27th of February 2023. Thanks for that, Kim. Councillor Tommy McGuire. I'm going to manage to Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Happy to, rec uh, to propose the recommendation and obviously to encourage as many people out there as possible to engage with the consultation. Good morning, thank you, Chair. Thank you, and Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of comments to make, please. Um, under Enniskillen Island Town, one of the key themes or the actions there is position Enniskillen as a destination of angling excellence. I know that way back in 2003, the angling, uh, the urn anglers came to present to council. So it's long been um, an aim of theirs to get an angling hub, particularly for coaching young people. Now, I think one of the one of the um, sites identified was Wolf Lock near the near the hospital, near the Southwest Acute Hospital. And I just wonder if we could look into um, progressing that with um, with Southwest Acute Hospital, that land there for the provision of a, an angling hub for coaching, um, and make that a proposition or proposal, please. Also, um, we've just mentioned young people. Um, one thing that I'd like to see in this consultation, I don't actually see it, it, it may well be there, and I just have missed it, is um, accommodation for young people within the town and an aim to be almost like a university town. We have uh, Southwest College, we have Caffrey, we have trainee doctors and nurses at the Southwest Acute Hospital. And if we can provide enough accommodation, that will strengthen our argument for more, more training, more education for, for our young people in the third sector. So I'd like to see that in there under Action 8 or Action 13, under healthy and inclusive town or a thriving town. So um, it's just a comment on that. That may well come up in the consultation, but I welcome it. I'm happy to second the proposal to, to note. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Michaelhoff. Just to support Councillor Armstrong and what you just said there about you know student accommodation, for example. And I know that Councillor Armstrong uh, will have picked this up from dialogue dialogue, for example, with the CAFRE leaders, and it's their earnest desire to see that. And it seems so sensible, you know, that we would put in effort to partner up with the CAFRE people. You know, the way we did a, a welcome reception for them this year, and we do that for the new doctors. Those are instituted things now, but there's a key message coming from Councillor Armstrong about what is needed. And then maybe I would ask him, what lessons might have been learned from the 
OMA engagement, you know, that can help inform the interscaling approach because the OMA ship uh, plan has has gone ahead, you know. So now, you know, there would have been some successful engagement exercises, some not so successful. So I presume we're learning the lessons. And then finally, just um, messages that I've picked up again to reinforce opening up of the town hall at the heart of Enniskillen is an important thing as well. Open it up to the people as much as possible, and we'd like to see a plan for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And do we need a second or just for what Councillor Armstrong proposed, Kim? And Councillor McAlear, we can lean on you for that. OK, thank you. Councillor McAlear. Chair, just um, uh, declaring interest as an employee of Southwest College in relation to the, the second part of the proposal, but very supportive of the first one, and maybe as part of that, Councillor Armstrong, I'm sure she will agree maybe to include um, in terms of the, the angling proposal that we focus or we contact um, disabling angling, disabled angling enthusiasts or disabled angling associations nearby in terms of that inclusivity and accessibility for, for that sport. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Absolutely, Chair. Yes, I welcome that. That's a very good suggestion. Thank you. And thank uh, Councillor McIlduff for his comments there. Um, it, it, it did come to light when Caffrey mentioned that there are some of their students couldn't get lodgings in Enniskillen and they were coming from as far as Derek um to to Caffrey for for their for their studies. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Did you want to comment on that at that stage? Kim? Yes, certainly we can feed all of those comments into the consultation process and pick up on some further engagements um, in that regard. And in terms of the engagement, we, we will learn lessons from OMA, although there was you know, a good level of engagement and the consultants who were working with were impressed compared to you know, wider engagements, which they're involved in all of the time, that you know, the good levels of participation and recognise that you know, a lot of effort had been put in by council staff to, to reach those levels. But we will continue to, to adapt and learn. And that's probably that's one of the reasons why we're trying a Saturday slot as well for a webinar. So continuing to try new approaches. OK, members, that's um, proposed and seconded. Agreed. OK, we'll move on to item 5.6 is to consider a report on the meeting of the Agriculture Liaison Group held on the 10th of November. And maybe Kim, I can move that on to recommendation. Is that all right? The members have had a chance to read that. So have a proposal just for that. Councillor Rainey and seconder Councillor Robinson. And all agreed. Thank you. OK, members, the next item is item 6.1 is to consider a report on the Good Relations Action Plan, uh, 2023 to 24, Paper G. And that's what's John Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the, the Good Relations Action Plan is included in Appendix 2 uh, uh, of, the, of the report, uh, the annual uh, action plan, um, which is led, I suppose, by the, by the Good Relations Audit, uh, which uh, covers the period 2021 to 2024 and is due for renewal uh, in the next year. And, and the audit is included in uh, Appendix 1 of the report. Um, uh, Chair, there, there's a, there are a number of priorities in relation to it which are included at 2.1 of, of the report. Our children and young people, shared community, our safe community, and our cultural expression. Uh, and it is all, as always, presented on, on the template provided uh, by, the, by the Executive Office. So, Chair, it's recommended that the Council approves the, the Good Relations Action Plan for 23-24. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dan Armstrong. Chair, yeah, thank you. I'm happy to propose um, the approval. Um, just I had an email today saying that the Public Health Agency is inviting people to complete the Ethnic Minority and Migrant Community Support Organisation's Emerging Issues Questionnaire. So that's um, that may be worth looking at as well um, and to submit responses by the 16th of December. Let's so just to add that in. Thank okay, you. Thanks for that. Councillor Swift. Yes, Garmagath, Kirlik and I too support it and we were uh, heavily engaged in the sh making and shaping of the plan. Um, it's quite the investment and uh, cost attached to it. Uh, but, you know, but I can't help feel the irony somehow that pity the same good relations wasn't demonstrated from the executive office itself, the entirety of Stormont. It seems somewhat hypocritical anyway, but that's just tuppence worth. And everybody is sick of it at this stage, as already mentioned by councillors with other issues that are affecting and impacting us greatly, but supportive of this document. Gura Are you happy to second that, councillor? Uh, yes, certainly. Yep, thank you. That's great. Thank you. 
Okay, that's agreed, members. Item 6.2 is to consider a report on the draft lin linguistic diversity policy. John. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, the Council adopted the linguistic diversity policy in 2015 and it has been reviewed um, and the changes uh, are included in Appendix 1 and a clean copy of the proposed new version of the policy is included at, at Appendix 2. Um, the, the linguistic diversity policy, it's a lot more than just language. Um, it, it includes all sorts of non-verbal languages, sign language, Makaton, Braille, and, and, and so on. Uh, and it recognises that those particular needs of, of all those mediums. Um, the, it should be noted also that we have an Irish language policy, we have an Ulster Scots policy, and indeed during the consultation period, many of the queries which, which arose related to the Irish language um, the, the, in, in relation to that we shouldn't be bringing forward a, 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 a linguistic diversity policy whilst the Irish language uh, question uh, hadn't been, had not been sorted out yet. Um, but I suppose just to point out to members that the, the linguistic diversity policy is much wider than Irish language or Ulster Scots uh, or, or other issues. It, it includes all sorts of language, in fact, the overarching policy that which those feed into. Um, uh, other responses included uh, commentary around the need for a linguistic diversity policy, uh, including the, the concern around the, the cost of implementation. Um, but it is, the policy itself is, is wide and encompassing and is indeed a legislative requirement uh, for ourselves in the Council. Um, so the, therefore, Chair, it's recommended that the, the Council approves the linguistic diversity policy included in Appendix 2. Thank you for taking us through that, John. Have we a proposal, members, for this item? Councillor, oh, Councillor Swift, well, go to Councillor McAleer, he has his hand up. Sorry, no, Chair, happy enough to propose and, and again commend the, the officers involved in the report and again the inclusion of the disability advisory groups that have been uh, contacted in relation to this one. So happy enough to propose, Chair. Okay, and Councillor Swift. Yes, I'm getting used to my swanky Christmas glove. Here, look, it's taking me a little bit slower. But yes, definitely. Uh, second the uh, entire report, Garamagat. Thank you, and Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you. It's. Uh, I, th I think it's up a learning experience for for both those that were involved and the officers. That the the, uh, the consultation that went out, I think, was too broad and too open. And didn't lack enough information for the members of the public reading, reading it, and then that 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 brought some of the responses that we got. And I think that's something I know why you would leave things broader and wider to give you more scope whenever you want to implement things. But but sometimes people take that as that you're using it something underlying in it, and I think I think that's something that we maybe need to take on board sometimes with some of these consultations around policy, because I know. A, a great deal of them were wasn't what the policy was intended to do, but the reading of it was what they and they 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 saw on it. And again, uh, from the community I represent, it, it seems to be a majority of them were an, more animated about it than any other community. So, so I think if we can keep these things more closed, it, it may make it easier for people to respond when they're not given a full wide scope of of what they can say and what they're actually responding to. Okay, thank you. It's proposed and seconded, members, and agreed. Thank you. Okay, the next item is 6.3, to consider a report on investigation of work-related deaths, Northern Ireland Agreement for Liaison. John. Thank you, Chair. Um, the District Councils, the, the Health and Safety Executive, uh, the PSNI and the Police Ombudsman for, for Northern Ireland uh, all have a role in investigating work-related deaths. And there is a document uh, which was uh, signed in 2007 called the Investigation of Work-Related Deaths in, in Northern Ireland Agreement for Liaison, which uh, talks about all the interagency response in, in, in work-related deaths. Um, 
the district councils and the the HSE and I are responsible uh, for making making adequate arrangements for the enforcement of health and safety legislation. Um, and I suppose this is a review of that document of that liaison uh, document, um, and it, it must be signed off. It has been reviewed, uh, and the changes are sign are highlighted in Appendix One of the report, um, and it must be approved by council. Uh, so it is the recommendation that the council approves the investigation into work-related debts in Northern Ireland Agreement for Liaison and sign off by the Chief Executive on behalf of the council. Thank you, John. We're looking approval for that, members. Councillor McAleer. Chair, I uh, propose to note, um, but just in doing so, I think it's incumbent on members that we actually look at, um, just noted early on in this report item, 2.1 on page 1. District Councils and HSE and I are responsible under Article 20 of the Health and Safety at Work Order for 1978 for making adequate arrangements for the enforcement of health and safety legislation with a view to securing the health, safety and welfare of workers and protecting others, principally the public. And this is particularly important and indeed timely for this Council and members of this Council to bear in mind. We are responsible. Um, and I would say, just in relation to those councillors who have previously used the excuse or cover of surcharge, or who are maybe happy to put a price on the safety and well-being of workers and the general public, this is uh, something that is worth bearing in mind. Um, perhaps next time a careless extractive company doesn't escape with an ear miss, perhaps next time the families of any affected worker decides to legally pursue the councillor or indeed those councillors who opposed any actions proposed to take to ensure safety and eliminate health and safety risks at hazardous site. So that's something just worth bearing in mind given the discussion from, from last week, Chair. Thank you. Okay, that's proposed, Members. Councillor McLaughlin. Yeah, I'd like to propose that we approve uh, the Chief Executive signing off on behalf of the Council. This is legislation that I hope this Council never has to use and I trust that the staff will sufficiently enforce the, the relevant uh, legislation that this legislation never has to be used. And, and that's my proposal that we, we uh, uh, endorse that the uh, Chief Executive signs on behalf of the Council. Okay, I think, was well, Councillor McAleer, you were happy enough to propose that, were you? And I can take John as a second, is that all right? John, thank you. Okay, Councillor Barton. Thank you. Um, just one co comment on health and safety and the Health and Safety Executive and the cooperation and working together with the Council. Can, can I ask, um, what cooperation is there? For example, do the Council take out uh, various advertisements through social media or, or what, whatever means to perhaps highlight at, particularly, at particular times of the year various health and safety issues? For example, coming into the spring and summertime, health and safety within the agricultural sphere, you know, children, children and machinery and various issues like that, and perhaps health and safety at Christmas time in relation to electricity and lights and dark evenings, etc. Do Council do anything in cooperation like that? Thank you. Well, I'll see. Um... Uh, Chair, the, the HSE and I largely give out the, the promotional aspects and, and, and promoting good health and safety. Um, so I suppose we are not that proactive. When, when we say in, in Section 2.1 uh, that the Division of Enforcement Responsibility between District Council and HSE is determined by the premises sector, it, that it, really, it is really the areas for which we are responsible for and which the HSE and I are responsible for. And maybe just going back to Councillor McAleer's about construction and manufacturing and whatever, that is not the responsibility of local council. It is the responsibility of HSE and I. We are responsible for the smaller scale, for, for retail, catering services, leisure and cultural services, community, consumer services, and office-based uh, type health and safety. Uh, and maybe in those sorts of areas, we maybe we do not give out a strong enough message in times, and it's something we'll take on board maybe for, for promoting those areas, whereas in manufacturing, construction, um, mining and quarrying and whatever, that is certainly the responsibility of HSE and I. Okay, members, we'll move on. That's been proposed and seconded. Uh, the next item is 6.4, is to consider report and consultation and proposed changes to the Food Law Code of Practice. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, there is proposed from the Food Standards Agency of uh, revisions to the, the Food Law Code of Practice in, in relation to new food standards and, and the delivery model. Um, the, the councils are the, the competent authority responsible for the verification of compliance with food law and food business establishments and, and at the point of entry. Um, and the, the, as because we are the Food Standards Agency is required to consult on the amendments of, any, of the code which the, for which they are responsible for prior to implementation. Um, and the code does require regular review and revision to ensure that it reflects uh, current priorities. The, the, the new code um, addresses the shortcomings of the of the current approach identified through the local authority survey, which was undertaken in in two thousand and eighteen, um, and that that survey has in fact informed the the revisions uh, to the code, and whilst officers are very supportive of the code we maybe would have some uh, reservations in relation to the impact that it will have on workload and indeed uh, the financial elements of it uh, in in complying with it um you know i, I think that the 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 true cost of implementation of the proposed scheme, both in terms of officer time and in, in implementing the model of IT cost, is, is not yet known. Uh, and until that is, uh, we, we have, as part of the consultation process, we have given our reservations in, in relation to the cost and the time involved. Um, so therefore, Chair, it is recommended that the Council approves the draft consultation response on the proposed changes to the Food Law uh, Code of Practice uh, in relation to new food standards and delivery. Model. Thank you, John, for that. Okay, members, you've heard the report. Can we have a proposal, please? Councillor Warrington, thank you. And a seconder, members? Councillor Bell, okay, thank you. And agreed. Okay, members, the next report is to consider a report of Director of Community and Wellbeing, Paper K. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, three elements to the report, Chair. One is to seek approval for the Western Health and Social Care Trust to locate the breast screening uh, unit at Fermanagh Lakeland Forum. Um, this is an annual um, uh, approval uh, for a period of four months starting in February of 2023. Uh, the second element is to consider a request received from Shop Mobility OMA in, in seeking um, financial support towards uh, rental costs. Um, they're looking for a contribution of almost £16,000 from 2023 onwards towards the cost of setting up Shop Mobility Hub in the foyer of OMA Community House. Um, you know, I think we do recognise that shop mobility provides a, a great service in, in the home area with those who have mobility issues. Um, however, that provision is not part of our core services and we certainly have no budget available at this time to support these initiatives. But uh, what we are proposing here is that the community support officers will work with Shop Mobility OMA uh, in order to identify and apply for external uh, funding opportunities. Uh, and the final part of the report, Chair, is an update on the rollout of the cost of living initiatives, which were discussed at the policy and resources meeting in November. Uh, I know I've been getting a lot of uh, queries from members in, in relation to how it is progressing, and, and those are included. Uh, an update on that implementation is included at appendix. One. So therefore, Chair, it's recommended that the Council approves the location of the breast screen mobile unit in, in Fermanagh Lakeland Forum from February, notes the request for shop mobility in seeking financial support, but office, uh, offers officer support to identify and apply for external funding opportunities, and notes the update on the rollout of the cost of living initiatives to the most vulnerable in the community. Thank you, John. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to Director John Boyle for his report. Uh, just with regard to the three parts of the recommendation, happy to propose uh, the recommendations in, in full. And just with the, the second part of the recommendation, uh, I note what he's saying about uh, some of our council officers working with the relevant people there. And that's to be encouraged no matter what we're doing, that we have our council officers working working with those uh, groups and individuals. So happy to propose, Chair. Thank you, Thank Councillor you. Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll second the proposal and, and just maybe to put in a, a conflict of interest. Uh, I am actually very involved with Fermanagh, uh, the Nuskillen-based um, shop mobility team, and maybe it's something we need to be 
you know, we can't sort of leave them out if we're going to give assistance. I know they'd be in constant contact with the council officers, maybe not so much recently since the onset of COVID, but uh, they're obviously basically financially, uh, financially the, the, the struggle as well. So maybe if we could include them uh, in this as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Let's propose and second. Thank you, Councillor McAdoo. Okay, uh, thank you. That's a good report there, uh, Chair. And uh, maybe the one aspect that I want to concentrate on is the cost of living uh, package, the measures that are detailed there, uh, £250,000. Uh, a lot of work went into it, and uh, for instance, John, our director, would have told me that you know a lot of the staff and his directorate applied themselves till you know, designing the best possible programme. And I know that myself because uh, members of the environmental health team, you know, the regulatory services and the community services would have joined with me in a number of meetings and John himself, you know, in meetings, for example, with St. Vincent de Paul, just as one organisation. And uh, also, you know, um, our poverty officer uh, would have accompanied me till uh, meetings with food banks and uh, you know 70 families were helped by one of our food banks in one day that's a fact one day 70 families crossed the door seeking help and got help and I think that's why you know we've made good use of our 250,000 there's other measures, but I'm going to concentrate on support for food banks, which are absolutely necessary. Like, and to see the way it operates, you know, there's bags of food in the doorway, close to the doorway, and uh, some people call them a two or a three or a four. For example, if a family of three or a family of four needs uh, food for two days, that bag is called a three or a four. Give me a three or a four. So 70 of these bags were handed out in one of our food banks in, in one day. So I'd like to salute those people uh, who work, who volunteer in the food banks as well. But earlier today, then I met with representatives of St. Vincent de Paul, um, representative from Edirne and a representative from the Oma area. So Edirne linked into then a uh, St. Vincent de Paul and the Oma area represented. And they just want to express their appreciation to us as a council for the significant uh, you know, amount of money that we have contributed to them, which eases the burden on them. And uh, we talked about it being scary out there and uh, higher demand and a big demand coming from working families. Um, and, and that was uh, established in the consultation, you know, the informal type consultation that went on for a few months there. So I think the council has listened and uh, those meetings were important. Uh, listening to the people with uh, disabilities and access issues at the Bonacre was important as well uh, because, uh, you know, there's an extra burden placed on people with disabilities. And it was Dermot Devlin who made this point about, you know, if you depend on electrified equipment for heat, you know, pain management and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, you have an extra burden. Uh, there's other things, you know, you'd want to say in the context of this, but... I would encourage community groups out there, Chair, to investigate the warm, the warm places or warm spaces program within this, because if you provide activities, and you uh, provide perhaps a late lunch or an activity for a group, but, and and you provide a warm space in your community at this time, then you're eligible to apply to the council for warm place support, you know, maybe towards an energy payment or whatever. So those are my comments, Chair, okay. and uh, just to spot the Council doing something good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McLaughlin. Yeah, I think uh, Councillor Michael Duff has covered that nicely. Um, just, Victor used the dreaded words there, conflict of interest, and, and in case it tidies things up, I, I would like to second the proposal and, and remove Victor. We'll take that. That's Without okay. his permission here, I'm just jumped in in front of him to see if any embarrassment. Thank you. And Councillor Armstrong. Yes, just, just to... Um, also support what Councillor McIldup has said, um, because 
I do think the cost of living initiatives taken by the council really do need to be applauded. And I think the website in particular, the information there, just interested to know, do you have any detail on how many clicks there are on that information? I mean, I think many of the councillors, we've handed out the cards, the information. Um, one thing there under St Vincent de Paul, the service level agreement, unless I'm reading it, I don't quite understand to cover all conferences in the district. I mean, maybe... I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe it's just a typo, and I'm sorry to bring it up here, but I just wonder, the fuel support via St Vincent de Paul, um, I that, just that's covering all parts of the district. Go ahead. Chair, Chair a, a conference of, of St Vincent, it's, it's not a typo. It, uh -huh. it is an individual unit in an individual location. Okay. Uh, yeah, within the district, so there could be a conference in in a in a village, or like you know, there is the Enniskillen conference, there is the Oma conference. Uh -huh. That's what they are known as okay. the individual. Glad to learn something new. <laughs> of St Vincent de Paul. Okay. Uh, in relation to your question on how many clicks or how much activity we're getting on the website, I don't have that ha that yeah. information at hand, but certainly I can I can make that available okay. to members okay. uh, of the of the activity in in relation to to the, our website and indeed uh, in, in listen to also to the QR code. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Debbie Coyle. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just uh, wondering on the warm spaces that um, Barry just mentioned there, is that open to all local um, community groups or are uh, council officials, you know, writing out to specific people in specific groups in specific areas? Or is that going out open for any group to apply for? Okay, we'll see. Do you have clarity yeah. on that? Chair, any, any group can apply for it. Now, there is certain criteria uh, that must be met in order to be successful in, in the warm spaces. It was included in the PNR report of, of last month, and I can make that again available to members also. But any, any community group, you must provide an activity, you must provide whether it be uh, some sort of hot refreshments or hot, hot snacks uh, in order for people, uh, and it, it must be accessible by all and all of those sorts of various criteria. Area, uh, that is, but uh, certainly any any community organisation, any group can can make an application uh, as long as they are a constituted group uh, for uh, for warm spaces. Okay, okay Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, my apologies, Chair, for uh, joining uh, the meeting late. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, John Boyle for his report and to compliment John and his team on an excellent uh, suite of cost of living initiatives. Um, I think that this is a broad uh, base of initiatives which will provide the best possible use of our uh, resources and will provide relief to many uh, needy families. I want to particularly uh, mention the fuel support program um, uh, via St Vincent de Paul uh, I think members will know uh, this recent uh, cold spate that we've been undergoing. We know that to keep our homes warm, we have to keep the heating on uh, a lot of the time. And uh, that fuel support to families will be greatly needed and greatly uh, um, appreciated, I have no doubt. Uh, the other uh, two initiatives that I want to make mention of is the support to the independent advice uh, centres. OMA Independent Advice Centre and Community Advice for MANA. Um, there has been a lot of talk, Chair, recently in the media about um, uh, families in need and particularly uh, uh, the so-called uh, working poor. And I think that any advice that can be given to families and individuals regarding uh, uh, management and optimising benefits is very much to be welcomed. And finally then, Chair, uh, the slow cooker initiative, uh, the extra 1.5 uh, uh, thousand that will be allocated to that scheme. I think it's an excellent scheme. It will allow people to cook good quality food economically and uh, provide healthy, nutritious meals for their families. So very much to be welcomed. And uh, I think that Fermanagh and Oma District Council uh, have really um, uh, given a lot of thought to the use of the resources and I, I hope that this programme will bring many benefits to those families in need in our district. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Councillor Fitzgerald, are you 
maybe you took your hand down again. It's just seen it was up there for you, man. Okay, members, that's proposed by Councillor Thompson and seconded by Councillor McLaughlin, and all agreed. Okay, and the final report in this section, 6.6, .6, to consider a report on events and festivals 22-23, Paper L. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. A um, couple of elements all related to the event strategy working group, which was held on, on the 30th of November, and uh, the minutes of that are included in Appendix 1. Uh, the first element is to seek approval to provide support to Donala Cultural Heritage Centre and Project St. Patrick Committee here in Enniskillen. Um, not here in Enniskillen. <laughs> <laughs> in Enniskillen. Um, uh, with £23,000 each to deliver St. Patrick's Day. There was a discussion at the Advanced Strategy Working Group in relation to the options for provision. Uh, one was because of the, the financial difficulties of, of the Council is the provision of no sponsorship for the St. Patrick's Day or indeed to provide sponsorship at the historic le levels which were which have been previous. Both uh, Project St. Patrick and Don Ola were keen for an enhanced uh, level of financial assistance in order to deliver the St. Patrick's Day events. Uh, but um, it isn't, given the, the financial uh, constraints, uh, the maximum that we could offer is what they historically got. Uh, and they have both agreed that they can deliver uh, the programme of events at that level. But if funding were to reduce, that it, they could not deliver anything at all. Um, so uh, the event strategy working group concluded that the, that uh, we should provide uh, sponsorship to the value of 23,000 to each of the groups uh, for the St. Patrick's Day events in both uh, Enniskillen and, um, and OMA. In relation to the sponsorship review, uh, the event strategy working group were informed that a formal sponsorship re review will take place um, in in uh, before the call out for in the 23-24 year, just to to look at the the learnings from from the from the process uh, so far, um, and and to see if there anything needs to be changed or developed, and a report will be will come forward for for uh, members' attention uh, at the come of that review. And uh, just in relation to the event strategy and the events and festival strategy, uh, that a review of, of that will also take place uh, or may have to take place in line with the, the visitor experience development plan uh, and the action plans. Um, and I think it was expressed that events is a very important part of that visitor experience development plan. And in light of that, the strategy will, will also need to be reviewed. Uh, therefore, Chair, it's recommended that the Council notes the, the minutes, uh, the draft minutes of the Event Strategy Working Group, approves the support to Donola um, and Project St. Patrick, approves the lighting of Enniskillen Castle and, and Struel Arts Centre in Green on St. Patrick's Day, notes the update and actions on the review of the Events and Festivals Strategy, and notes the update of Events and Festivals Corporate Sponsorship Review Timetable. Okay, thank you, John. Councillor Bell. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I just have a question at this stage. Um, I know recently OMA moved from the model of, I suppose, having a parade in the town to this model where we had stages and um, different things going on about the town. And I went in March and it was it was quite enjoyable. Um, I remember the argument for that being um, there had been a decline in attendance at St. Patrick's in OMA um, over a number of years. And, you know, we we're trying something new, something different. Um, so I was just wondering if, if there's any information at this stage, if that improved attendance. It's, it's just, um, I remember I had a few comments made to me uh, that were missing, of people missing the parade, and it'd be nice to equip myself with information for next time around if it goes ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, I think, and I, I can actually get this information. There was a review done of the St. Patrick's Day events in both Enniskillen and Oma, uh, and in both cases, it was seen to be a great enhancement on uh, on what went previously and i have to say especially in oma the reports coming out of oma uh, uh, following the the new format were very very positive both from those who attended and indeed the traders in 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 the town so um i think that this format has actually been a huge success okay members we're looking for a proposer and a seconder for the report both councillor alan Rene and the seconder please members councillor michael duff Okay, thank you, and agreed. Okay, members, um, we'll move now just to your agenda and item number 11. So if I could have a proposal just to go on to confidential, Councillor Irvine and Councillor Thompson to second. So we'll just...
Thank you. We'll just put the recording on again, Adam, please. Thank you, Adam. OK, members, the recording's on. We'll just ask our director, Kim, to sum up whilst on committee. Hey, Chair, so during confidential business, uh, members considered matters arising uh, from previous meeting of the committee, and there were no matters arising, uh, agreed the proposals and recommendations from a report on VDP governance and delivery, agreed the proposed recommendations on the Green Road public right-of-way, and also agreed the proposed recommendations on the Fermanagh Lakeland Forum Redevelopment update. Thank you. And a proposal to note the uh, Councillor Thompson and seconded by Councillor Robinson. Thank you. To note the update. Okay, members, I think we move back now on our agenda to item 7.1. Just uh, members, these are for information. And if we could get through them tonight, it'd be good to get this agenda finished. It's a frosty night out there. So, yeah, we'll just go straight 7.1, uh, straight to recommendation members. Uh, 7.1 is to note the report in the capital programme. Have we got a proposal for noting? Councillor Irvine and seconded by Councillor Robinson. And agreed. Thank you. 7.2 is to note the report of proposal of application notices, paper N. And again, that is for just noting members. Councillor Dehan. You Thank you, Chair. Chair uh, Clara, I just wanted to declare an interest okay. uh, in that item as a member of the Planning Committee. Thank you. No problem. And Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly, are you happy to propose? I'm happy to propose the note. Thank you. And a seconder, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Councillor Bell. 7.3 members is to note the report in the UK Shared Prosperity Fund NA Investment Plan and proposals for council led entrepreneurship support services. 7.3. Uh, that's for noting as well, members. We have a proposer, Councillor Armstrong, on that one. Okay, yes, proposed to note. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And a seconder, members, Councillor Barton. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Willers, are you on that item? 7.3, Chair. Yeah, the Shared Prosperity Fund. Yes, I have. Just a quick comment to make on it. Um, a note there, the fund that's been uh, agreed or announced there recently, but it seems to fall far short um, of what was previously allocated from the EU. I know that I'd raised this a few months ago in the council as well, um, and we had wrote to the Department of Leveling Up. Um, unfortunately, it appears that um, our documentation has been um, ignored, um, which no surprise there. Uh, <clears throat> it's another example of the detrimental impact that Brexit is having on us. Um, this funding will mean that community groups in particular will lose out. Um, I think it's around £90 million in total, that the, the shortfall there and the difference. So it's another example as well of decisions um, being taken um, by people outside of this jurisdiction and having a detrimental impact on us. So I just want to note that point, uh, Chair. Thank you. I'll take that on board. Thank you, Councillor Withers. Councillor McElduff. Yep. Uh, just to support Councillor Withers, I wonder would it be possible for uh, a report in January or February uh, to detail the impact of this cut to European Union funding to be you know, assessed and put before us as a council, you know, impact on employment, impact on delivery of services. At the Peace Plus consultation in the Strule Arts Centre, there were fairly strong, you know, um, voluntary groups, uh, charities present, and they were bemoaning the loss of this, you know, like, um, for example, it was even feared that Disability Action would lose posts from this, you know, a group like that. Um, so essential to the community. And then you hear of Erasmus-related courses being delivered through the college that they're in danger and uh, employees are in danger. So just uh, it'd be good to get a report back uh, in the new year on the impact on our council area, the, the cut to EU funding, which this amounts to. Okay. Kim, have you or Kim a comment on that one? I suppose, but we're aware is that there's i suppose an overall reduction uh, there's an intention that the funding will ramp up over time but in the short term there will be a reduction in terms of the investment plan the uk shared prosperity fund we we have some headline figures now but we don't actually know at this point um in terms of the specific allocations and where they will go so it may be slightly 
premature at this point to, to know and be able to relay to you the specific impacts on particular organisations or where funding will be distributed to. Um, so maybe if we could look again at the timeframes for that. When available, Councillor Markelda? When available, just uh, even early feedback, early indications. And of course, you know, uh, Kim and the team would need more time in, in that context. Thank you. OK, and Councillor Green. Yeah, I just wanted the second Barry's uh, proposal there. OK, that will we'll do that. Thank you, members. OK. The next item is 7.4, is to consider the quarter two performance improvement plan progress report. Councillor Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll ask you to give me a bit of leeway on what I want to talk about this, but if you go to key issues on page one, there are five of them. And one says we will protect the protect the environment and improve its sustainability, and we'll work to maximise the opportunities for for Mananoma District as a leading tourist destination. Um, in a strange way, this has to do with the hospital, but uh, uh, we all would, we would all support the campaign for the retention of emergency surgery at the SWA. The issue needs uh, highlighting, and I, I certainly wouldn't want to detract from it. But what my comment is, what I've noticed lately around Enniskillen at various roundabouts, white banners have been erected on the roundabout purporting to support the SWA, but also purport, uh, supporting a certain minority political philosophy. Now, in my opinion, the, the signs are tacky uh, and do not look well and detract from what we've tried to do with the town. Uh, we have an accommodation with the various agencies about uh, signage and advertising banners on the approach to the town. So I'd ask that the council write to the folk who have erected uh, these signs and ask them to remove them, redesign them and relocate them in line with council policy. Are you happy to propose the, the, the note of that report as well, Councillor Baird? Certainly. Yes, and I think John has an update maybe on that. On that issue, yeah, yeah, chair. Just to, just in relation to that request, um, under the clean neighbourhoods, we have a responsibility, a legislative responsibility in relation uh, to banners and so on and so forth. And we actually have uh, at this point in time uh, communicated with the Department for Infrastructure, who mostly own the infrastructure on which uh, all of the banners across the district, uh, no matter what they are, uh, in order to ask them to to. Uh, remove them. It is their it is their responsibility to remove them, and we have asked them to do that. And we will co remain in communication with them in relation to it. I'm detracting from the campaign, but there is a process to be gone through. And on the approaches to the town, there are locations for uh, appropriate uh, erection of such uh, advertising or protesting banners. Thank you, Chair. Are you, are you happy we don't need that as a proposal then, Councillor, separately because the letter's already been sent? Uh, sorry? We, we don't need a separate proposal just to, to write because the letter's already been sent? Yes, that, yes. that's fine. The process that's is in hand. Process. Thank okay. you. Okay. And a second are members for the report before us. Councillor Robinson, thank you. Councillor Keenan. Thank you, Joe. Well, I'd like to make my dissent known uh, against this. I think that's a disgrace for a councillor to come in here in one hand and claim to be supporting the campaign, another to, to be removing banners of support. Um, there are, certain councillors are not as vocal when our, when our community is uh, plastered with um, all sorts of banners throughout the year. And to, to look to remove one, uh, banners that are supporting the, the, the hospital, such a vital service in the area. I definitely disagree with that. Like I said, it's Chris. We'll note that for you, Councillor Kane. Thank you. Chair, could I just clarify? I did not ask for removal, I asked for relocation. Okay, thank we'll you. Thank you. How many times are you allowed to speak there, Chair? For Councillor Keenan. The next item, members, is 7.5 is to consider the report of the Director of Regeneration and Planning, and that's for Noken as well. Member 7.5. Is there anything you need to cover on that, or is it straight to the recommendation? Just the recommendation. okay. If we propose our members, Councillor Thompson, and a seconder by Councillor Robinson. Thank you, members. I bear with me. I think we're on to or at item eight now, eight point one. Uh, this was a report was requested, I think, as well on to note update report on multi-use games areas, and that's item eight point one. So, okay, there's a few there's a few hands up on this one. Um, we'll just go to the chamber first, Councillor Irvine. 
The, the report is very straightforward and it is really just an update report. So I'm proposing the uh, adoption of the report, Chair. Thank you. Thanks for that proposal. And Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the report. Uh, I'm prepared to second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Councillor Keenan, maybe your hand was from the last time or is it on the Muggers? Uh, Councillor Debbie Coyles next. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I have a, I have to declare an interest um, on this item. Sorry, I should have done it before. But I just want, um, back in 2018, I think, um, after consultation, and I, and I appreciate that none of the council officials that are at the top table now um, were at, at the top table, I don't think, then. Um, not in the same um, capacity anyway. Um, and the and un, after a consultation by the council, I think with Blue Zebra or something Zebra, um, it was agreed that um, a, a, a multi-use or weatherproof, um, nothing special would be um, put in Kavanaugh. Um, now, like we've heard nothing, and I know I've spoken to John on this on a couple of occasions. But this is this is over 10, 11 years now. And um, in the last two or three years, um, we, you know, I, I mean, there was even the issue about who owned the land and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I would like I'm wondering if we can get a copy of that original um, um, consultation report where it was um, suggested that we would. We're right on the outskirts of Enniskillen. Um, and it's all right to think that we could use the forum, but in fact, our children can't a lot of the time use the forum because it's block booked. Um, it's two, three miles. Not everybody drives and we struggle to get um, funding for transport. And we, we have in recent times through the PCSP. But, you know, there's a piece of land there that could be developed and we really need to start kind of moving the community just loses um spirit when we kind of think we're on to something and then we just continually um kind of get let down um and the other thing i wanted to ask was um we're in our north um but our council or i'm very happy with the council official that's working with us and but i'm just wondering why in the last few months we're when back in enniskillen or working with the um, council, uh, um, the community worker for Enniskillen, rather than the community worker in uh, North, which we was doing um, a few months, you know, why was that decision made? Um, you know, it's getting very, it gets very difficult when you try, we've done, we've actually got our most recent um, consultation done, supporting communities are going to, um, community survey, sorry, um, like we did in 2019, as requested by council, and I think we've done one in 2014. Um, and there's there's never any feedback back. Um, you know, either the workers get changed or, you know, I mean, obviously nobody could help COVID. So obviously we, we expected um, very little to be done then. But it is getting very um, frustrating um, for volunteers um, and for moving things forward. And there's developments going up around the area, so there's more families that could benefit if there was something in place. That end of town, I mean, That's there's literally time. nothing. Sure, sure. But uh, well, okay, can, thank you. We can take that on board for you, John. Do you want to? Yeah, Chair, uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, Councillor Coyle, uh, you, you, I have been in contact with Councillor Coyle in in relation to the issue in in Cavanagh Lake. Uh, we are in working, well, we are trying to work with uh, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive in relation to the piece of land that, that uh, Councillor Coyle refers to, um, to see if the community themselves could, could do an issue. Um, members will be aware that we discussed the issue of Muggas the last time, when, and this is the response in, in relation to that, and, and there is a council poly, or there is a council position on it that no more Muggas would be created by the council. 
uh, until all of those that we currently have are brought up to standard. And uh, there was a report at the last meeting in relation to you know those that need to be that further work needs to be done in order to bring up to, bring up to standard. Um, so we are we are currently working with the with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. There there have been a number of personnel changes in the Housing Executive, which our legal department were working with, which have changed, and that has slowed the process down. In in relation to the personnel, the community support officers in in relation to Erin North, uh, Councillor Coyle will be aware that that a member of staff uh, was did did leave the organisation and, and and has left, and because of that, there has been a shift in personnel uh, and people covering while we whilst we we fill that fill that role on on a permanent basis. Okay, thank you, John and Councillor Green. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, no, I'm a, a, a bit shocked there with what John's after saying, because as far as I'm aware, uh, that uh, my understanding was that that wasn't the case, that no more mugs would be done. Uh, there was a, a, a clear understanding that the Council would uh, follow through with its commitments from the Legacy Councils. No decision that I know of was taken to stop that. Uh, there was a couple of reports which I looked for because of of no, and this is uh, the last of these. So am I am I right now to, to think that the council's position now is that the the uh, number of villages that the council neglected and didn't. Uh, uh, follow through on their commitments is now going to be uh, cast aside, while other villages that has these muggers uh, are going to be upgraded. Is that? Uh, 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 can, uh, uh, can John just answer that, and then I would like a quick response to that. Uh, John, yeah, yeah, chair. I'm I'm just pulling up the of where it was decided. Uh... Yes, it was agreed at the June 2017 Regeneration and Community Meeting uh, that uh, uh, an, an audit would take place of all muggas, and until that audit was taken place, that uh, no further muggas would be provided within the within the district, and until all muggas were were brought up uh, to an appropriate standard, that that process you will be aware that we have uh, upgraded three muggas. In, in this financial year, and there will be an ongoing program of uh, upgrading those to bring those to, to a health and safety standard, if nothing else, uh, to, to the standard of wh where we are. So we are still in that position. Uh, uh, th thanks, John. Uh, my understanding, John, of that, now, the first part of that was correct, that there was going to be an audit done. And, and nothing more would be done to the audit was complete. Can you read me out the specific line then where it says that nothing then would be done until all was upgraded? Because that's not what I ever read. And uh, in fact, uh, I would propose that we as a council follow through on our commitments, that promises that we made, promises that the chief executive made to me, the promises that the uh, former uh, director in your position made to me uh, uh, in front of witnesses is going to be followed through. Okay, th thank you, Councillor Green. I know we had a similar discussion last month now on the same issue of Muggers. Um, well, can I'll... John just answer that question, Chair? John? Chair, like I say, it was in the 2017 Regeneration and Community Meeting. I can certainly get those minutes and I can forward them to members in, in, re to what, in relation to what was agreed okay. at that. Maybe if we had that clarity just forwarded yeah. around, John, and that, and just on that specific issue. Alison, and, uh, Chair, just can I clarify, if that isn't in, in the minutes that there was a request for an audit, but that there was no decision made to uh, uh, not... Uh, build any new muggers until the others were upgraded. If that part isn't in it, uh, can uh, uh, I have an, an apology here for uh, the misrepresentation that's been per, uh, put in front of us tonight? Just bring in uh, the Chief Executive, Seamus. Yeah, okay. No, Chair, it was just a comment, and, and we can obviously provide the, the detail of the minutes that's been requested. It's the copy or the information that I have in front of me re references the the meeting as John have June 2017 and the third part 
uh, of the the agreement or the minute, as I understand it, is that the council agrees we've, we've covered to carry out an audit and then no additional MUGA site should be developed until the MUGA audit is carried out and all existing sites are up to the required standard. Subsequent to that, in the February 2018 Environmental Services Committee meeting, it was said that to, to reference was made rather to, and this is a direct quote, the considerable work undertaken in the legacy councils in respect of play areas and MUGA provision and our council FODC needed to honour these previous commitments and factor these into the development of any future strategy. So there, there is in the 27, or sorry, the 2017 minute specific reference that no additional MUGA site should be developed until the audits carried out and all existing sites are up to the standard. And then in 2018, reference is made that any future strategy should honour the previous commitments of the legacy councils. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, th thanks, Alison, for that clarification. So, where is that uh, strategy included in this report? As, as I'll bring in the Chief Executive, that this strategy maybe hasn't been completed. No, I think Chief Chair, we'd. I, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. I think Chair, we had in, in a previous report, and I'm, I'm whether it was October or previously, uh, it had been highlighted that, and uh, Councillor Green has mentioned some, I suppose, personnel who've departed. It work was not progressed in on the audit that had been anticipated. That work commenced relatively recently, uh, which identified a number of specific health and safety. I think uh, we actually provided the template of the um, the muggers which were at the end of their natural life. Those that were fine for another couple of years, those that required additional information. So the the that work would obviously have to be finalised. The strategy hasn't formally commenced, but the audit work would be an important uh, building block of that. OK, is that OK, Councillor Green, at this stage? Yeah, uh, uh, I will uh, follow the chief executive's uh, uh, take on it, uh, and uh, I would hope the director would follow it. Too. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll move. We'll move forward on, the, on that issue tonight, members, because I know we did discuss muggers last month as well. Uh, that is item 8.1, members proposed and seconded. Uh, the next item now is correspondence. We've dealt with 9.1. 9.2 is um, to note correspondence dated the 11th of November from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs regarding financial assistance to landowners. Is this piece of correspondence for, for noting, Kim? Yeah. Just for noting, members proposal, please, Councillor Armstrong and seconded by Councillor Robinson. Thank you. And then 9.3 has been done. 9.4 is to note the following items. And 9.41 is correspondent dated the 17th of November. That 9.41 has been dealt with as well. Yep. And 4.2. 9.4. Two, sorry, members. 9.41 hasn't, hasn't been dealt with. Sorry, members. As correspondence stated, the 17th of November from Keith Finnegan Air Quality and Biodiversity Unit regarding ammonia emissions in me, Sleeve Bay. Is that correct? Area? Okay. And that's for noting. Is that correct? Can we have a proposal, members, to note? Councillor Robinson and a seconder, please, members. Councillor Warrington, thank you. Uh, 9.41 and 2. Councillor McAleer, you know the ruling of the meeting. We'll move on to item 9. Point. We've dealt with right up to 9. Point. That's all the cork ones, is that correct? Yep. Okay, members. I had one piece of AOB was from Councillor John Coyle. Very quickly, John, just a proposal, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, over Friday night, Saturday morning, the Blake and Garrison areas uh, was badly affected by uh, rain and then it froze and it has caused extreme black ice in the area. Um, a number Two roads in the locality have had grit on them, but uh, large areas. I would like uh, to write a letter to uh, Danny Healy, DFA, highlighting that there was um, insufficient uh, grit piles. Now, I have spoken to local staff and they say that there is grit piles, but the grass has grown over. The grass has grown over. Now, I'd like to make a proposal that uh, the DFA works with local community groups and maybe the council will assist in some way to uh, facilitate that maybe 
permanent uh, you know, bunkers are provided in rural areas. Grit bunkers are usually used for towns and villages, but uh, as we're such a rural area, and I know that when grass grows over the uh, grit piles, it, it probably is a waste of money, and uh, drivers then don't feel safe and secure on the road. So uh, I would like to make that a proposal that we write and highlight, uh, you know, that something has to be done uh, and it is it'll be cost effective in the longer run. OK, thank you. Thank you, John, for your proposal. And I've seen Councillor Feely and then just first. So, Councillor Feely. Yeah, yeah, I can second that. Yeah, there are the web sleepy already. Oh, it's still sleepy, but I've been in contact with um, men all week, um, couple of days and getting great pays back out. And the people, we are using them on the R road, the Glen Road, we are being used. It would be a lot better if we could get the solitary to grit them from Garrison there at Golney, but we're not going to go there the night. But okay. yeah, no, I'm the second. Thank, thank you. Well, thank your seconder for that. Thank you. And very quickly, please, members, Councillor Barton. Thank you. I would also like to support what uh, uh, John has has said in relation to grit piles. I think uh, rural areas tend to be forgotten about. Yes, grit piles are left on the side of the road. They're left there. They're never replenished. They, for example, over the past week, some of them would need to be replenished three or four times. The grit piles are not very big and they're left at huge distances apart. And there are sometimes on some of the roads, very, very limited grip, grit piles. I think that should be brought to the attention of Department of Infrastructures. Immediate attention. Well. Okay, and Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you. Similar vein, uh, as if the DFI could make points accessible for farmers, particularly the dairy industry. I uh, had a few farmers on looking to get access. I'm, I'm sure I know Councillor Barton had as well. I'm sure Councillor Rainey uh, and, and other councillors. Uh, it's getting the, the milk tankers in and uh, they're just not susceptible to bad roads due to the, the construction and the way that they're, they're, they're built. The farmers would be quite happy to go in their tractors. Uh, what may be quite off the piece for their, their red diesel, but uh, they need to get the tankers in to get the, the milk away. It's backing up at the farm and it was an issue, but I think we managed to get somewhat resolved, but it's easy access for grit yeah. would be a major concern if that could be included in John's okay. letter. And Councillor Rainey? Just, just a word on it, uh, uh, Chair. And uh, Councillor McLachery, I'm sure it will agree with me. Uh, in recent years, uh, we have had in the Garbachi area, which is uh, a number of very steep hills and quite a number of poultry units as well as uh, the dairy. And the farmer will go for a link box full and grit his section if and when required. And it's a very satisfactory way of operation. And I would ask that it be continued where it has been practiced before. Yes, certainly. Thank you. OK, members, I can, there's agreement on that. Thank you, members. Uh, just before we close the meeting, uh, we'll not meet again to the new year, so we'll wish you all a happy Christmas and a new year. Uh, tomorrow night, the meeting's in Oma, so nobody landing on a skill. that right, Alison? Right, the meeting's right. moved to Oma for heat purposes, so... And thanks to our team tonight of IT and our directors and chief executive. And thank you, members. It was good to get the business done. So uh, good night and safe home on the, on the slippery roads. Good, good night. Thanks. Good night. Happy good Christmas. Night. Good night. Happy Christmas, everyone. Great. Chairman, happy Christmas.